Like Rabbi Marco mentioned, it's not just the Zohar class. Tonight is a very, very special night. Tonight is the Ilula of my great ancestor, my great great grandfather, Rabbi Ishayao Pinto. Rabbi Ishayao Pinto was also known as Arif Akadosh. Now we're going to speak, we're going to break the shoot a little bit about Rabbi Ishayao, and a little bit, Bezat Hashem, and the rest, Bezat Hashem, will be about the Zohar Kadosh, and we're going to start the first shiur. Last shiur was the rules of learning Kabbalah in Zohar. This shiur, Bezat Hashem, will be actually entering the real limud of Zohar. You know, Rabotai, before we start to speak of Rabbi Shayao, I would like to explain what is the lineage? How are we, Mishpachat Pinto, connected to Arif Kadosh? So to go up that tree, there were five or six generations, from, uh, at least from, my, uh, from where I stand, there is Rabbi, Moshe, Rabbi Yaakov, my, my father, Shichye, my Kadosh Baruch Hu Rabbi Yaakov's father is my grandfather, Rabbi Moshe Aaron Pinto, that uh, we all know Rabbi Moshe. Rabbi Moshe's father was Rabbi Chaim Pinto the second. Rabbi Chaim Pinto the second's father was Rabbi Eden. We spoke about Rabbi Eden. We also did the big Ilula for Rabbi Eden. Rabbi Eden's father was the famous Rabbi Chaim Pinto the first. Rabbi Chaim Pinto, the one that we all know. Rabbi Chaim Pinto's father was Rabbi Shlomo Pinto. Rabbi Shlomo Pinto was a big Dayan, a big judge in, uh, in the Morocco. Rabbi Shlomo's father was Rabbi Yosef. And Rabbi Yosef's father was Rabbi Shayao Pinto. Now Rabbi Shayao Pinto was not only big in Torah, that he wrote seven books, that these seven books, until today are one of the core teachings and learnings in the Torah world. Rabbi Shayao Pinto was also, from before he was even born, he was the combination of two big families. He was the combination of two big lines of tzaddikim. Rabbi Shayao Pinto, his father, was also named Rabbi Yosef Pinto. So there, are, there are two Rabbi Yosef Pinto. There's Rabbi Yosef, the son of Rabbi Shayao. Then there is Rabbi Yosef, the father of Rabbi Shayao. The father of Rabbi Shayao, Rabbi Yosef Pinto, met a big tzaddik that came from Italy. That his name was Rabbi, Chai, Rabbi Yosef Vital. Rabbi Yosef Vital, a lot of Yosef tonight, Rabbi Yosef Vital was the father of Rabbi Chaim Vital. Rabbi Chaim Vital, as we know it, he was the tzaddik that wrote the eight gates of Arya Kadosh. All the Kabbalah that of Arya Kadosh exists because of Rabbi Chaim Vital. So Rabbi Chaim's father was Rabbi Yosef. That Rabbi Yosef took Rabbi Chaim Vital's sister and his daughter and actually married him, married her, to Rabbi Shayao. And that is how Rabbi Shayao, and Michele Rabbi Shayao's father, Rabbi Yosef uh, uh, Pinto, and that is how Rabbi Shayao was not only from the line of, of the Vital family, but also from the Pinto family. It said about Rabbi Yosef Vital, Rabbi Yosef, the father of Rabbi Chaim Vital, that his neshama was actually the Gilgul of who? The Gilgul of Rabbi Meir Baalanis. So it was not just small tzaddikim, it was not just small uh, people that came down to the world, it was mamash, big tzaddikim with big neshamot. Rabbi Shayao Pinto wrote, as we mentioned, seven books. One of those books, until today, is his most famous book, which is the explanation on the En Yaakov. Today, any person that goes to any Bet Knesset Ashkenazi, Sfaradi, any Bet Knesset that exists, one of the first sets that is bought is En Yaakov. En Yaakov is all the Gemara, all the stories, all the Masyot that exist in the Gemara, all comp co composed and put together in one set, in one book. That is En Yaakov. Rabbi Shayao, from a young age, already showed his father and all his community and all his surroundings that something big would come out of him. Rabbi Shayao, when he was already a small kid, the Chidushim that he had, the Ruach HaKodesh that he had, was something so special that as a young kid, Rabbi Yosef Pinto sent out his son to go from one Rav to another Rav, from one Mekubal to another Mekubal, to go to study, but also they had the will to see what this young boy that came down to the world, this young Neshama that is bringing something new and special to the world. Rabbi Shayao Pinto was a student of Rabbi Yaakov Abulafia. Rabbi Yaakov Abulafia was one of the big tzaddikim and one of the big dayanim in the, in the poskei halacha that existed at that time. Rabbi Yaakov Abulafia had a dream, had a, a goal, which was to bring back the Sanhedrin, 
We know Abu Tayr at, at the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, there was what we called Sanhedrin. What was the Sanhedrin? The Sanhedrin was a group of Dayanim, a group of Rabbanim, that they were able to not only control al but they were also really able to control everything. They can rewrite an alakha, they can change an alakha, they can completely build and bring down an alakha from Shamaim, and it could be an alakha le From the time of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, the Sanhedrin was cancelled. And it said that even there was big Tanaim, for example, Rabbi Yehuda bin Baba, that Rabbi Yehuda bin Baba wanted to bring back the Sanhedrin, and it was said that anyone that tries to bring back the Sanhedrin will be punished. Rabbi Yehuda bin Baba tried to do it, and he was killed for that reason. Rabbi Yaakov Bulafia, the, the, the teacher of Rabbi Yishya Pinto, had this vision that now we are preparing, we are entering the generation of the Geula. And if we're entering the generation of the Geula, what must we have? A Sanhedrin. So Rabbi Yaakov Bulafia, he searched the world and found five students, that these five students he would last smich, what we call today asmacha. Because Asmacha was cancelled. The concept of to do La Asmacha to a Rav was cancelled for 2,000 years. So Rabbi Yaakov Abu Lafia brought five tzaddikim together. That those five tzaddikim would have the title of Harav Hamusmach. One of those five tzaddikim was Rabbi Shayao Pinto. And another very famous one that we all know is Rabbi Yosef Karo. That anyone that opens up a Shulchan Aruch, we'll see Harav HaMusmach Rabbi Yosef Karo. Harav HaMusmach was the title that Rabbi Yaakov Abu Lafia gave to Rabbi Yosef Karo as well as to Rabbi Shayao Pinto. So Rabbi Shayao came from a very high place. Rabbi Shayao was one of the, the friend students of Rabbi, of, of Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Karo. HaMechaber, the one that composed all the halachot that we learned today, was all brought down just because of him. Him and his group of Rabbanim. So Rabbi today is a very, very special night. Tonight, is not only we're going to teach Zohar, but we're also going to speak about, maybe we're going to bring a nice story about Rabbi Shayao Pinto, and may the merit of Rabbi Shayao Pinto, that tonight is will stand with everyone here, and give everyone here a lot of bracha v'atzlacha, and everything when you do Beit Hashem. Rabbi Shayao Pinto had said about one time, that he would search and travel the world, in order to find Sitra Acha, in order to find idol worship, where he can destroy it. Rabbi Shayao Pinto, was always on a mission to go and to try to clean the world, to cleanse the world from everything that bad that exists inside of it. It was told that in one of the cities in Syria where Rabbi Shayao lived, there was a very poor man that he had panasa. He would make a living by, by doing what? By going and searching in the trash can and searching what he can find that he can save, searching what he can find that what could he repair, and he would sell it. And that is how this very, very simple Jew was able to bring food to his table. Very simple man, very hardworking man. He would go from the morning, go from one trash can to another, searching what he can buy, what he can find, what he can fix, and what he can sell. This very poor man, one day, came across a man that passed away, that sold a big amount of all his used uh, uh, things that he had in his house. This poor man, when he heard the opportunity that he can go and he can acquire all this Everything that was in his house for free, almost free, this poor man took the opportunity and ran to do it. So this poor man received a big, big shipment of bags and bags and bags or maybe boxes or wherever, wherever it was at that time. And he had to go and sort through all those boxes in order to find what's salvageable, what he can save, and what he can sell to bring food to his table. This poor man was searching and searching and searching and he found a jacket. In this jacket, he started to look through the pockets. He said, maybe they dropped something. Maybe the, the last owner left some money inside, something <coughs> valuable inside. I'm going to check it before I throw it out. So this poor man, he starts to look into the jacket, starts to see what he can find. And something that falls to the floor, and he hears a metal that falls. He looks down, what does he find? A small little statue. A small little metal statue. That the small little metal statue was actually used as idol worship for that uh, man that passed away. So this Jew, he sees this, he says, Hashem Yerachim Chas Shalom, a little statue, he threw it to the ground, and he continued to look through the stuff. While he's looking to the stuff, he hears a voice that screams, Jew! Now the poor man, he gets up, he looks, he sees the house empty. So he says, okay, maybe I was just dreaming, maybe I heard the neighbors scream Jew, and I continued to, 
to uh, something that is in my head. A few minutes passed, and he hears again, Jew, Jew, but now it's getting louder. And this poor man, he hears his voice, he starts to look through the house, he starts to see where can he find where this voice is coming from, and he couldn't find anything. A couple of minutes pass again, and he hears again this voice saying, Jew, pick me up. And he says, where could this be? He looks down, and he sees this little metal statue is talking. Now, we have to understand that at that time, the Sitra Acha was much stronger. That time, the Avodah Zarah was much stronger. Just to, to strengthen how HaKadosh Baruch Baruch Hashem lowers the Avodah Zarah from generation to generation, there's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, page Kuf Bet. The there the Gemara says that Rav Ashi was sitting down with all his Talmidim, was sitting down with all his students. And he told all his students that tomorrow we're going to talk about the three kings that en lehem chelek leulam abba. The three kings that don't have a place in ulam abba. And he said that we're going to talk about chaverenu menashe. As we know, about time we're not going to get into the story of menashe. Menashe is a story that we're going to speak of at Hashem in the future. That night, Ravashi went to sleep. And when he went to sleep, he had a dream that menashe melech came to him. And in this dream, menashe melech came to him and told him, why are you disrespecting me the way you disrespect me? Why do you refer to me as one of your friends, one of the reshaim that Elam chelek leolam abba? The Gemara says that Menashe Melech, even though he was a Rasha, even though all his life he made Bnei Yisrael do sins, he told Rav Ashi something, he asked Rav Ashi a question, that Rav Ashi was not able to answer in Alakha. Right away when Rav Ashi heard this question, he said, if you know the answer, why don't you tell me? So it says that Menashe Melech answered him the answer. So Rav Ashi asked him, he said, I have a question for you, Menashe. If you're such a Talmit Chacham, if you're such a Tzaddik, why did you go to other worship? Why did you go to do sins? So the Gemara says that Menashe Melech told Rav Ashi, if you lived at my generation, you would lift your skirt, your dress, you would hold on to my tzitziot, and you would chase me to come and do idol worship with me. So we see Rabbi from every generation, idol worship gets worse. It uh, gets yeah, less worse. Every single generation, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like we say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu always keeps a balance in the world. Today, we don't see big tzaddikim that get up and do big miracles. But on the other hand, we don't have Baruch Hashem to deal with very, very heavy sitracha, very, very heavy idol worship. So this little metal statue was on the ground. And he was screaming, Jew, pick me up. This poor Jew, he was confused, he was shocked, he didn't know what to do. He picked him up. He looks at him and he sees his little eye worship, his mouth was moving. He was telling him, put me on a shelf and I will bless you that tomorrow you will double what you make every single day. Now this poor Jew, as much as he was a Jew that had imunah, he said, uh, this is something that's talking to me. I've never seen something like that in my life. So he put him on the shelf and he says, what do you want from me? He says, let's keep me and you a secret. And tomorrow, I guarantee you, what you make regularly, you'll double it. This Jew, he said, you know, I don't know, what, what is the story with this uh, middle statue? Maybe I'm dreaming now. I'm going to leave it there. Tomorrow, I'm going to return to it. The next day, he went to work. And exactly what the statue told him, he sold double of what he usually does. He made double the amount of money what he usually makes on a regular day. He came back to the statue and he said, what do you want from me? So the statue said, polish me and build me a stand, and every single day you're going to double what you made the previous day. So this poor man, he hears this, he said, let me try it. If I'm going to double what I made today, that's going to be a fortune. And if I can keep on doubling and doubling, I'm going to become a very rich man. So this Jew built him a shelf, and every single day that would pass, he would double and double and double and double the amount of money. And he became one of the richest men that existed in, uh, in Syria at that time. This man didn't forget all his friends, didn't forget all the poor people that lived with him. And this man, his entire time that he was wealthy, was building homes for people, building shoes, giving tzedakot. There was no poor in the city that didn't have food to eat. He really was a real tzaddik, a real Baal Chesed, and he went from house to house and never forgot anyone that he knew that was in need. This man kept this statue hidden in his big palace now, very, very deep, and nobody knew, not even his wife knew, of the little idol worship that he kept. One day, Rabbi Shayo Pinto returned to the city, 
And they told him that this very rich man was doing a big gathering of all the Jews. So why don't you go and speak at this big gathering that he's doing in his home? So Abi Shayao asked him, this rich man, I remember him to be a very poor man. What happened that now this very poor man became the richest man that exists in the city? So everyone told Abishayahu, it's the biggest secret that the city has seen. Nobody knows how this rich man in one year became from the, went from the poorest person to the richest person. So right away, Abishayahu said, I want to go and to ask him really, well, how did he become so rich? He went to the event, he saw this rich man, he grabbed him, he told me, tell me your secret. The rich man, he heard this from Abishayahu, he said, I cannot tell you my secret. My secret is kept just for me and it will only be for me. Abishayahu looked at him and said, if you don't tell me your secret, all your wealth, I guarantee you, will be lost. When he hears this, Abishayahu Pinto was a man of miracles. Baha works, but also opposite works too. When he hears this, he says, you know what? Whatever the Rav asks, I will do. He took him into his room. He opens the door. He sees a closet in the room with lights and a candle. He opens the closet and Abishayahu sees this little, little, little metal idol worship. Abishai looks at him, at the poor man, and he tells him, I have a question for you. Do you have Imuna? So the poor man said, of course I have Imuna. Of course I have faith. He said, then I have a question for you. If now, idol worship were to come to you and to give you money to come and bow down to it, would you do it or not? Chas v'shalom. I would never sell my God for anything. So Abishai says, and how are you keeping this idol worship in your home? How do you keep this avodah zara in your home? but still you could consider yourself as a person that has emunah. So Abishayahu told him, if you have real emunah, you take my cane and you break the statue. He took the statue, he put it on the, down to the ground. And the, 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 the Yaakov in many of the books that, he, that, that, that mention the story, that every hit he would give, the statue would scream more and more and more until he broke it into pieces. And those pieces he sent to the young. And those pieces he sent out to the ocean. It says that that rich man, every single day, the same way that he doubled his money to get up, he would cut his money in half every single day to go down until he returned back to his original state. But what's amazing is that a person that really he goes and he goes to the side, he looks where he can go and obey the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't forget him. It said that all the poor in the city that he supported and all the houses that he built and everything that he did, they all came forward to support him to, to, to make sure that he has everything and he returned back to his very high, uh, rich place. Rabbi Shayar Abutai was a man of Maasim, was a man with a tzaddik of not just Limut Torah, not just a big Alakhan, not just a lot, big in Kabbalah, but he was a man of getting up and doing miracles. So may the merit of Rabbi Shayar Pinto stand with everyone here and may we all see that Hashem the effect in those miracles that Rabbi Shayar did to his generation in the past, we will see it in our own eyes in this generation. Amen. 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 Today, Rabotai, we're going to start Bet Hashem as the first Shur of Zohar. We mentioned that this Zohar, we will not be doing a spread out pieces from the Zohar, but we're going to focus on the day-to-day -day things that a person does. So we said that we're going to start from the moment that a person wakes up until a person goes to sleep, including Chagim, including Yamim Tovim, including Mitzvot, including Averot as well. And all what the Zohar says about our actions, the effect of our actions, and why we should do certain mitzvot, and why we should be very careful from certain uh, averot. We're going to start our botai with the Zohar in Parashat Bereshit and page Nun Gimel. The Zohar in Parashat Bereshit and page Nun Gimel speaks about a mitzvah of netilat yadayim. It speaks about when a person wakes up in the morning, the importance of one that gets up to wash his hands to do netilat yadayim. And why is it so important that a person shouldn't do anything before he does nitilat yadayim? And I will tell you something that is very, very, very uh, interesting. I am uh, telling everyone from now, Bezat Hashem, to remind some of the rules of Limud Zohar. Anyone that has a question that doesn't, is not understood, he can hear the question. After the shiur, we will give Bezat Hashem a question and answers. But questions that are clear to all, but not clear to an individual, there's no need to hold on to them, to move on, but to hold on to the question. And whenever HaKadosh Baruch Hu will make one worthy of, of understanding this question, he will understand it on his own. The Zohar Kadosh opens up, Tachazi, <coughs> come and look what the Zohar has to tell you. Adam Arishon, before he did the sin, 
of the tree of knowledge. That the tree of knowledge is a very, very interesting sugya in the Zohar Kadosh, which we're going to speak in length in another time, another shiur. Before Adam Arishon did the sin of the tree of knowledge, Adam ruled the world. The entire world was under the hands of Adam Arishon. There was no koach, there was no power, there was no animal, there was no being that didn't have fear from Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon did not understand and did not have the concept of fear. Not an angel, not any exterior powers like Shedim, like Ruchot. Nothing was able to touch Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon was on the top and there was nothing that was at his level. There was no opening in Adam Arishon in order for something to come and even to touch the position where Adam Arishon was. It said that before Adam Arishon was he had Chava, when Adam Arishon, the first few days of his existence in the world, he did not have Chava. The Zohar Kodesh says that he had one Pilegesh. What is a Pilegesh? A Pilegesh is a woman that he has kids with, but is not his wife. That it's a woman that he has kids with just to have kids, but as a wife, nothing to do with his wife. This Pilegesh was named what? Her name was Ne'ama. That Ne'ama, as we know it, was not a Ben Adam, was not a human being. Ne'ama was actually a shed. Now, what is a shed? Shed Rabotai, it's in English, it, it, explain, it translates a little bit differently, but shed in, in English, it's, it's a oh. demon. 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 Ah. But it doesn't really translate like that. Shedim was creation that was created between times that their form was never fully closed. That is why they're in between both worlds. So this shed, Ne'ama, was the Pilegesh of Adam Arishon. Adam Ne'ama would to continue, and you're going to understand why I'm mentioning this, to get married to Shemdon, that Shemdon was another shed, that this shed, between them both, they brought a kid, that this king was named Shamdai. That Shamdai was the king of all Shedim, and you're going to see why I'm mentioning this, that until today, the Zohar Kodesh says, to the end of times, Shamdai will always be the king of all the Shedim and all the bad that exists in the world. It said, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu called all the animals, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu gathered all the animals together, for Adam Arishon to name all the animals, Adam Arishon got sad. Adam Arishon saw that every animal that he brings forward for him to name them has what? A partner. That for every male, it had a female. For every animal, it had a wife. Adam Arishon saw himself as the only creation that does not have a wife of his own. Adam Arishon had sadness in himself. How is he alone in this world? with no partner like him. <coughs> Zohar says that when Adam felt this, this pain, he went to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And when he came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he told HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you brought me to this world, you created me with your own hands, but you created me alone. So why did you create me at all? You brought every single animal down to the world with a zakhar and a nikava, nikava, a female and a male, a husband and a wife. And me, the only creation, that exists with no male and no female. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu heard this, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took to attention those prayers of Adam Arishon. And he told Adam Arishon that he was to create a wife for Adam Arishon. HaKadosh Baruch Hu went and took Afar, took dust. dust, and from this dust, he created the wife of Adam Arishon. <laughs> what was her name? No, no, that was the second wife of Adam. That was the second wife of Adam. That is why I wanted everyone to, to, to come forward to try to answer. Now, but this name that we're going to mention, we're asking everyone to respect. That's a Chaim Arek who says that we do not repeat these names because these are names that are very, very uh, bad to repeat. Any of the names of the Shadim, we don't mention. We're going to mention them once just for the studying sake. But except for that, we do not mention Adam HaKadosh Baruch Hu took Afar, took dust, the same way that he created Adam Arishon, he created a wife for Adam. And this wife was named Lilith. That Lilith was the first wife that Adam Arishon had. Now Lilith and Adam were in a big problem between each other. Right after Lilith was created, Adam Arishon 
couldn't stop fighting with Lilith. Lilith and Adam Arishon were not able to get along at all. Why is that? Adam said, I am the first of uh, the Bnei Adam. I am the first human. I should be on top. The male should be on top. Why should you be on top when you were created last, when you were created after me? Lilith was not willing to accept the fact that she was going to have a somebody which is over her. Lilith was not willing to accept the fact that the man will be the leader of the men and, and the women. Nowadays, we're not going to get into, no need to get to politics, that's the Torah. <laughs> I, 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 don't, uh, I don't need to get The Torah is the Torah, and the Torah uh, uh, never changed. When Lilith understood that Adam Arishon was not willing to compromise, Adam Arishon wanted to be the top, and Chava was, and, and, and Lilith was not willing to be in the bottom, to be the one that's being led, Lilith ran away. And where did she escape? She escaped to the Yam, she escaped to the ocean, and there she found what? There she found a very powerful being. Who was this powerful being? Shamdai. That Shamdai, the king of all demons, the king of all the Shedim, married Shamdai. The Zohar Kadosh says that Adam Arishon, right after Lilith ran away, he found himself what? Alone. Found himself alone. Adam Arishon goes to Akadosh Baruch Hu, and tells HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you created me a woman, but she ran away. You created me, you brought me a wife, but she's no longer here. She ran away, she, she disappeared. So what did you do? You created me a wife that will not stand by my side. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu heard this, the Zohar Kadosh says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu went and called three angels. And he told those three angels, go find Lilith and tell her to return back to Adam. Go find Lilith and try to convince her to go back to Adam Arishon, to marry Adam Arishon. <coughs> Three angels searched the world and they found Lilith with who? Shamdai. With Shamdai. The three angels approached Lilith and they told Lilith, you know Lilith, Akadosh Baruch created you in order for you to be the partner of Adam Arishon. Why aren't you with Adam Arishon? If you are the partner of Adam, you should be with him. Akadosh Baruch created you for that reason. Lilith looked at those three angels and she told them, that is not the reason why I was born. I was born for a different reason. I was born, and this is something is very scary, that until today we do it, until today we, we have, especially in Moroccan, we have a lot of these minagim. Lilith said, I was brought down to the world, I was created in order to kill the kids before they reach the, to the age of eight days old. Before the Brit Milah, her job, but she comes and she's the one that Shalom is able to bring a, a sitracha, to bring bad to the world. When those three angels heard that, they got upset. The Zohar said that those three angels wanted to grab her and they wanted to drown her in the ocean. They wanted to kill her just hearing those words that she said. But the angels said, you know what? We can't, we can't go against the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us to not force her and to not kill her, but to try to convince her, we cannot do anything else. The three angels looked at Lilith. They said, please, we're asking you to come to Adam Arishon to fulfill the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So she looked at him, she looked at them, and she said, even if I were to come, I can't anymore. Why is that? Because now I got married and I went with who? With Shamdai. And we know, even in al that a married woman that goes with another person, with another man, Asur la Baal, Asur la Boel, that the husband that she was married to is no longer allowed to step foot close to her, and the one that she sinned with is no longer allowed to step foot next to her. When the three angels heard this, they returned to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, she can't. She already sinned with Shamdai, and because she sinned with Shamdai, she already brought kids which are Shedim, to the world, she cannot return back to Adam. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu heard this, he said, first of all, we have to make sure that Shamdai will swear that he will not step foot close to Lilith. Because why? She is the one that he did a sin with, and not Adam and not Shamdai are not allowed to step close to her. So as HaKadosh says, that she he took Lilith and he turned her into a wach. He turned her into like a, like a, a, a spirit. This Lilith, would go on to marry who? 
it's about it until today. Until today, Lilith is the, the wife of, of a person, not a person, of a, of a being. What is that being? Samael. That Samael has a wife, and as well, Kudush says, that the same way that Samael is an angel of its own, Samael has a benzu, a badzuk, a badzuk, a wife. Who is this wife? Lilith. As well, Kudush says, that until, until today, till today, this was a swear that was done between those three angels and Lilith, that those three angels said, that for every kid that you're going to put your finger on, we will kill a hundred of your kids. The Zohar says, every single day, till, till the Geula, 100 Shedim will be killed every day. What does that mean? That once a day, what does Lilith do? She kills one kid every single day, till today. The Zohar says that Lilith not only affects kids, but affects a lot of men that are here with us. How is that? The Zohar says, that any person that ever had a dream, chas shalom, of a lady or something like that that causes him at night to, to, do a, a, to, to, to sin, that is the doing of Lilith. That the Lilith comes to a man and takes a form of a woman or takes a form of, uh, of whatever that man uh, uh, in order for him to sin, and she causes people, men, to sin while they're sleeping. But until today, most, a lot of men here suffer with that. Not about that is something big. As well, Kodesh says, that from that moment, Hashem said He will not create another woman that's going to be made out of dirt like Adam. Because the moment I create a woman that is made out of dirt with Adam, two of the exact same beings cannot uh, correlate. Two of the exact same beings, two of the exact same powers, cannot one live as a leader and one as being led. So from that point, as well, Kodesh says, that Kodesh Baruch Hu, he peeled He made Adam fall asleep, and right after he fell asleep, what did Hakadosh Baruch do? He took one of his ribs, and who did he create? Chava, the second wife of Adam, not the first. The second wife of Adam. That the second wife of Adam was to go on and to do what? And to cause him to sin. As Hakadosh says, that we learn from this maaseh, from the maaseh of Adam. Something big. In the path that a person wants to go, in that path they're going to walk him. Adam Arishon, from before the sin, from before anything, when he was just created to the world, he had a search to do mistakes. He had a search to find something that was not good. Adam Arishon, from the beginning, he was created. As much as he was big in Kedusha, and as much that he was covered by the Orot of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but he had a hunger to go in the wrong path. That hunger that he had to go in the wrong path, he opened an opening. The moment you open an opening, you allow bad to come in. If a person wants to go in the Kedusha, and he takes the right path, the path of the Kedusha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will put on him Kedusha and put on him Bracha. If a person wants to go to the left side, to the side of the Tum'ah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will add on him to Ah. It's in our will, Rabotei. If one wants to become Kasher, if one wants to become Kadosh, he has to start the path in order to reach to, it, to the destination. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will do the rest. But if one starts, and he starts to point himself to the left, he starts to point himself to things which are not Me'achuz, which are not Kasher, HaKadosh Baruch Hu helps them. And that Abutai is something very big. That from that moment, that Adam Arishon, even before the sin of the tree of knowledge, he already did an opening for Sita Acha to stick on him. From the moment that Adam Arishon started to do all those small mistakes of searching for a wife, of having a Pilegesh, of having Nama, from the first place was Nama, was a Shedda. From all those small little mistakes that Adam did, he allowed, gave an opening for the Sita Acha, for Lilith, for Samael, to grab onto him and to turn his entire life with Chava to the, the world that we know of it today. It said Rabotai about Shlomo Melech, the exact same thing. We know Rabotai that Shlomo Melech was the king of what? Shlomo Melech was the king of the entire world. It said about Shlomo Melech that he was the only man that sat on the throne of Akadosh Baruch that there was no man that reached to the level of Shlomo Melech, that Shlomo Melech not only was king of a country, not only was king of a city, not only was king of the world, 
But he ruled this world and he ruled the world to come. He ruled up there. That there was no being, angels included, that did not fear Shlomo Amelech. That there was no opening for any bad to attach himself. There was no opening for the Sitra Acha to even touch Shlomo Amelech. It said that when Shlomo Amelech wanted to build Bet Amikdash, when he wanted to put together the first temple, he had a problem. Shlomo Melech was sitting down and he said, it's said in the Torah that we cannot use any metal tools to build Bet Amikdash. That no metal tools can be used to carve the rocks. That no metal tools can be used to cut the trees. Nothing. So Shlomo Melech came to the Skenim, he came to the Big Chamim, and he said, how are we going to cut all these stones? How are we going to cut all these trees to build Bet Amikdash? So the Zekenim told him, there is one thing, one material, which Chazal debate whether or not it was an animal or a material. The, the Mishnah in Avot, in Perek He, Pasuk, eh, Mishnah Vav, there the Mishnah says that it's one of the ten things that were created, Ben Hashmashot. We know about that the Akadosh Baruch Hu, right before Shabbat started, there's 18 minutes, Safek Yom, Safek Laila. It's a doubt whether it's day, it's a doubt whether it's night. The last moment that HaKadosh Baruch Hu can create, He created ten things. One of those ten things is Shamir. Like I mentioned, Abotai Chazal don't know exactly the debate whether or not it was an animal or a material. The Zekinim told him, in this world, all the Tzadikim, they told Shlomo Melech, that in the world there exists a material, an animal, that this material can cut anything. That anything that it touches, it cuts it in half. Not, doesn't matter if it's metal, if it's wood, if it's rock. This material, it's like a string. It's like as thin as a string, but the moment it touches something, it cuts it in half. Shlomo Melech said, okay, where can, I, where can I get this material? So the Navi says, as Zohar say, that the Zekinim told him, there's only one person we know that knows where it is. Who is that one person? Shamdai, that Shamdai is the only one, the king of all Shedim, he's the only one that can know where this material is being kept, where this material is being hidden. So Shlomo Melech went and took the head of his army. Who was the head of his army? Benayao ben Yehoyada. And he took Benayao ben Yehoyada and he told him to go capture him, who? Shamdai. Benayao ben Yehoyada went to search for Shamdai. He searched the entire world until he found where Shamdai rests. He looked and he saw that Shamdai has a well of water, that from that water, he drinks from it. What did Benayu Benayu had to do? He went, he took out all that water, emptied out all that water, and he switched it with what? Yeah. With wine. He said, when Shamdai is going to come, he's going to want to drink, he's going to drink wine, and it's an opportunity for me to capture. So Benayu Benayu had died, he stood in the side, and he waited. For Shamdai to come, he waited for, Sham, for, Sham, for, for Shamdai to be thirsty and to drink, and then there's an opportunity that he can come and catch Shamdai. Ben Yaw Ben Yoyada was he sat there and he waited and waited until he saw Shamdai comes, he drinks from the wine. He drank, he drank, he drank, he drank, and he continued to drink, maybe with Adar. So he tried to do a, he do a mitzvah, he drank until he fell. The moment he fell, <coughs> Ben Yaw Ben Yoyada had an opportunity to catch Shamdai. So it said that he took chains and he chained Shamdai, put him on his horse and took him to the castle of Shlomo Melech. And he brought Shamdai in front of Shlomo Melech. They gave him water, they let him come back from, that, uh, from the drinking that he did, from the headache that he had, I don't know what he had. Hangover. <laughs> huh? Hangover. Hangover. So he had a very bad one, apparently. If it's for him to drink until he falls, and really, and we said also the wine was so strong that it could last even four months. That's how they say how strong the wine was. That it was Tanaim, that on Pesach, on Pesach, they were to drink, and only in Atzeret, only in Shavuot, the they headache would come away. That's how strong. For, for, for four cups of wine. That's what the Gemara says. That is why uh, the wine at the time was very, very rich, very, very thick. A lot of... Uh, Alcohol inside of it. Wait, where, what store do you buy this at? I don't know. <laughs> Shamdai was chained, Shamdai was locked in front Shemdai. of Shlomo Melech. And Shlomo Melech asked Shamdai, where can we find this material, this animal, 
Shamir. So Shamdai looked at him. He told him, he said, you know, I know one place that it exists. But there is no way that you will be able to go and to bring this. There is no way that you will be able to go and to take out to that <coughs> Shamir. Why? Because it is kept by a big creature. In Sabotei, it's not in the Zohar or the Kabbalah. This is in the Gemara. In Gitin, in the Fsamichet Amud Alif. This is complete Gemara. We're not even going into Zohar for, for, to, to, to get this full uh, um, Masih. Shamdai told him that the Shamir is kept by a creature called what? Tanegolet Ba. It is a creature that holds the shape of a body like a bird. But this Tanegolet Bar is something that is very strong. And he swore, the Tanegolet Bar swore to Sarah Maim that he would keep the Shamir and he would not allow anyone or anything to touch this material. To give a little back story of what, who was Sarah Maim. This is a Shur of Zohar, also the beginning, so everyone needs to learn all these terms. The Gemara in Mesechet Baba Bata and Page Hay, there the Gemara says that what was Sarah Maim? Sarah Maim was a big leader, a big, the biggest creature that existed in the ocean. <coughs> so this creature was no bigger creature that existed. At the time of Noach, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu flooded the world, he told this creature, it's time for the world to return back to its original form. Swallow all the water that exists that covering all the land. So the Gemara says there that Sarah Maim didn't want to swallow it. He said, I'm not going to swallow it. You, you created me, you, you brought this shock into the world, it should stay like this. The Gemara said that Kaddish Baruch Hu kicked him and he killed him. <laughs> but the one kick that he, ki that he kicked, this Sarah Maim, he killed him. But before Sarah Maim was killed by Kaddish Baruch Hu, he swore to this creature, the creature swore to Sarah Maim, that he would protect this Shamir, that nobody and nothing would, <coughs> were to touch it. Now this Tarnagolit Bar, this big creature, was willing to give anything, it was a swear that it made, that nobody will ever touch the Shemir. Shlomo Melech looked for his strongest soldier to send, to bring what? To bring the Shemir. So Shlomo Melech calls who? Benayahu ben Yoyada. And tells Benayahu, which was not only a tzaddik, it was also a big koach, a lot of power that he had with war, a lot of bracha he had with everything that he would do, he would have bracha with. He sent him and he told him, go to this place and bring me the Shemir. The Gemara says that what Ben Yahu Ben Yoyada do? He took glass and he put a big sheet of glass in, in the entrance of the home of this creature, in the entrance of the, the, the hole of this creature. And after he put that glass, the creature saw it and was not able to go through it because he feared that if he was to touch it, it would break and it would destroy all what he had. And the moment that that happened, Ben Yahu Ben Yoyada had the opportunity to enter, to steal the Shamir, and to escape. The Gemara says that that creature was so sad and so uh, so much sorrow he had that it actually suicided. It killed itself just from the fact that it was not able to keep the swear that he made to Saramay, to the, 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 the head of the ocean. The, the Gemara says, Rabbi, Rabbi Benayu ben Yoyada brought the Shamir back to Shlomo Amelech. When he brought the Shamir back to Shlomo Amelech, Shamdai started to pinch and started to bother Shlomo Amelech. Shamdai looked at Shlomo and he told Shlomo, Shlomo, you are the smartest man that exists in the entire planet. You are the strongest man that exists in the entire planet. Neither me or any one of my people, the Shedin, were ever able to come close to you. It's not because you're something special. It's not because you're at a high level that we're not able to even approach you. It's because you wear a ring. This ring has the name Shami Forash carved in it. That if you were to take that ring off your hand and untie me from these chains, you would see what I would do to you. Shlomo Melech, when you heard this, a small amount of gava entered him. And he said, you're telling me that it's the ring and not my power? The Gemara says that he pulled off his ring. He unchained Shamdai. The moment he unchained him, Shamdai swallowed the ring and took form of Shlomo Amelech. 
He took the form of Shlomo Amelech and made Shlomo look like another man and sent Shlomo to exile for three years. And that, those were the three years that Shlomo Amelech was sent out as a poor man walking from city to city trying to tell everyone that he is the King Shlomo, but nobody believed him. The Navi says that all those stories of that Shlomo that we were doing sins was not actually Shlomo. All those stories was Shamdai in the, in, the form, in the form of Shlomo. Shamdai took that ring of Shlomo that was Chakuk, which was carved the Shem for us. He said, what can I do with it? It's a ring that holds such power. I can't use it because I'm built from Tum'ah. So what can I do with it? So the Gemara says that Shamdai went to the heart of the ocean and he dropped the ring there. He dropped the ring for to fall like that nobody would ever find the ring in, the, in existence. It said that after three years that Shlomo Melech was going from city to city, going from one place to another, trying to, to bring back what was lost, one day he was walking on the ocean. And when he was to walk on the ocean, he saw a fisherman that was fishing big fish. Shlomo Melech came to this fisherman and told this fisherman, can I buy a fish to eat? I didn't eat in a few days. The Gemara said that Shlomo Melech took that fish, he bought the fish, when he opened its stomach, what did he see inside? He found the ring. He took that ring and put it back, and that is what the Navi says, that Shlomo stood again. He got up and he was able to take back his kingdom, he was able to take back what was lost to the king of the Shittim. Abu the Zohar Kadosh, says if we look at both of these stories, we see something very, very similar. We see two people that did not allow, and they were not able, they, they were at the position where they, nobody was able to even touch them. That no power, no exterior power, no tumah, nothing was able to even step close to them. But because in one moment, they took the first smallest step towards the tumah, they took the, small, the, the smallest step in the path of the tumah, in the case of Adam, was searching for a wife and the Zohar says that he went with every single female animal in the world searching to find one that will fit him. Adam HaRishon that did that and Shlomo HaMelech that came and he let the Gava take over him the moment both of those big men took one step towards the path of Tum'ah what did they pull upon themselves? They pulled upon themselves Tum'ah. They pulled upon themselves that they allowed an opening for the Sitra Acha to enter inside. Adam Arishon that pulled on top of him and, and, and held the Tum'ah and surrounded himself with the Tum'ah, what did he bring to the entire world? He brought down and allowed the Sitra Acha to control what? To control life. That until before Adam Arishon did not do the sin of Etzadat, <coughs> Samael or the snake didn't have control on the life. They had no even opening to come and to shorten one's life because they were in the path of the Tushan. But the moment that Adam Arishon took a step and started to pull upon himself, started to surround himself with a Tum'ah, in that moment, he allowed the snake, the Sitra Acha, to enter into the world and to take control of a man's life. That until before the tree of knowledge, there was no death. The concept of one that is born and he dies existed the moment that Adam Arishon did the sin of the tree of knowledge. Now it's said that when the Nachash, the Nachash, the snake, is, is Samael himself, Samael is the Satan, the Satan is Malach HaMavit, it's all one big bad force, Sitra Acha. When he comes to a person after 120 years, and he wants to take his life, what does he do? The Zohar Kedush says that he comes with his sword, and he puts one drop of poison on the tip of his sword. And that one drop of poison, he points to the man, and the man opens his mouth. And the moment that he opens his mouth, he drops that one, point, that one drop of poison into a man's mouth, and that is how he takes a person's nisham. But that we're going to speak of in more length uh, another time. After a person, after 120 years, when Samael has now the permission and has the, 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 the level to come and to take a person's neshama, after 
He takes a person's neshama. What happens to the body? It's left empty. When the body is left empty, what comes down upon a person? Sitra acha, tum'ah. That we know that the person that has passed away, he has a lot of impurity that's around him. Why? Because the moment that the neshama is taken out, there is empty space. But not only that there's empty space, there is leftover light that the neshama, kdusha, left. The moment that there is an emptiness and a little bit kdusha that exists, what enters the body? All the impurities and all the tum'ah that could exist in the world comes and they devour and they eat the leftovers that were left in a person's body from his neshama. You know, Rabotai, that a kohen, kohanim, can you go to the, to the graveyard? Mm-hmm. Why can't kohanim go to the graveyard? Tum'ah. tum'ah. What's tum'ah? Tum'at amet. That the tum'at amet, the impurity of the dead, came down to the world. Because of who? Because Adam Arishon. That for seven days, anyone or anything that gets close to a person that is no longer alive is able to attach himself to that concentrated impurity that comes into a person when he passes away. That comes into the body when he passes away. Natabote is the big learning of the Zohar. Now, but how does this connect to the How did this entire, all this, all this was put together just for the Tirat Yadayim? How does all this connect to the Tirat Yadayim? It's all connects with the Tirat Yadayim, with something that the Zohar says. The Zohar opens up again and says, Tachazi, come see what the Zohar has to tell you. You know, but in the Gemara, when the Gemara wants to catch your attention, what does the Gemara say? Tashma. 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 Come and listen what the Gemara has to tell you. With the Zohar, when he wants to bring your attention, what does it tell you? Tachazi. Come see what I have to show you. And that is the difference between the Gemara and the Zohar. But the Zohar, it comes to show you. The, 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 the Zohar comes to show you. The Gemara comes to teach you. The Zohar Kedush says that at the time when the night, when the darkness starts to cover the world, and all the birds, they go to sleep and they hide. And all the animals hide in their homes. And all the people hide in their own homes. And people go to sleep. What comes down to the world? Big sitracha. Big impurity. Why does big impurity come down to the world? Because all those who are sleeping, what do they taste? Death. When a person sleeps, he tastes what? One sixth of death. I can't hear you. Uh, when a person is asleep, it's one sixty. So when a person is asleep, he brings down yeah, upon himself true. the concept yeah. that he's no longer alive. Yeah. That we know what the Zohar says, yeah. that every single night, the neshama goes where? It goes up. Yeah. That the body is left with no neshama. Right. Because all these people are sleeping, what comes down to the world? The impurity of the dead. And that impurity of the dead stays and sits on every single person. The moment that a person wakes up, all that impurity goes to where? Hands. Goes to his hands. That all that impurity that w- came down to the world throughout the entire night gets stuck in a man's hands. The Zohar Kodesh says that when a person wakes up in the morning, the first thing that he should do is wash his hands. Why? The Zohar says that the person should not move, shouldn't take a step off of his bed. According to, to the Alakha, we say, Arba Amot, according to the Zohar, you shouldn't move, you shouldn't touch anything, you shouldn't look at anything until you do Netirat Yadayim. Why is that? Because if a man has impurity on his hands and he touches things, what happens to everything he touches? It becomes impurity. If a person starts his day when his hands are what are impure, what path is he going to? He's going into the path of what? Of Tum'ah. One starts his path and gives an opening for the Tum'ah to take a hold of him. What will the Tum'ah do? What did we all mention? If one starts his day walking in the path of the Tum'ah, what will happen to him? He will be pushed. Tum'ah, Tum'ah will be able to come and to sit upon him. If one starts his day and he does not allow the Sitracha and he starts his day walking in, in the path of Kdusha, what will happen to him? More Kedusha will be able to come upon him. <coughs> it's like a butai, two vessels. If one starts his day, he creates a vessel. If you start your day with the day of the Kedusha, throughout the entire day, you will be able to bring down upon yourself Kedusha. 
If one starts his day with the day of the Tum'ah, he will able to bring upon himself throughout the entire day. Tum'ah chas v'shalom. Salat al is very important. The concept of doing Nitiyat Yadayim, the first thing that a person should do. When a person gets up and does Nitiyat Yadayim, he sets the stage for an entire day full of bracha. He sets the stage for an entire day where Kadosh Baruch Hu can add upon him Kedusha. But if a person gets up and does not do Nitiyat Yadayim, what does he set the stage for? Tum'ah. He sets a stage where every single bad thing in the world could come upon him. All the impurity in the world can come upon him. Not Abutai is the reason that it is very important. We should all be very, very careful Abutai with the mitzvah of Nitiyat Yadayim. If we want to have Baha throughout our day, we should start our day with Kedusha. Starting our day with Kedusha is not getting up and doing Limut Torah. Because even if you do Limut Torah and your, your feet you are walking in the path of the Tum'ah, all that Baha that comes down to the world doesn't go to you or, 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 or to, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All that Baha that comes down to the world can go Chas to a wrong place. So the first thing we should do, Abotai, and we should be very careful of, is Nityat Yadayim. We start the day with Gdusha, throughout the entire day we'll have Gdusha. We start the day with Baha, throughout the entire day we'll have Baha. Yes, that is the lesson of today, Bat Hashem. May the merit, Bat Hashem, Abotai, Abba Bichayim, Peter.